Hello, I'm Dan with the George Memorial Library, and today I'm going to be talking about the Colt Theater in Rosenberg, Texas. The city of Rosenberg was founded in 1883. Like many small towns that sprung up in the West, Rosenberg really began to grow when the railroad came through. The 1900 hurricane that destroyed Galveston also wiped out the town of Rosenberg. After the storm, the town was rebuilt almost from scratch. In 1919, Martin Colt Sr. moved from a small town near Waco, Texas and settled in Rosenberg. At that time, Rosenberg had a population of about 1,100 people. He became the manager of the Cozy Theater on the southwest corner of 3rd Street and Avenue H. Soon after, it was renamed the Playhouse Theater, then moved to its current location further down the block and was renamed the Liberty Theater in honor of the U.S.'s participation in World War I, which had recently ended. A Seaberg Pipe Organ Orchestra was installed shortly before the grand opening, which was on August 16, 1919. Because the theater was built during segregation, the building still has two entrances. The main doors that open into the lobby and the smaller side door for African Americans. I haven't come across anything that mentioned whether African Americans were allowed to go into the lobby to purchase refreshments or anything. And no one I spoke to recalled if that was the case. The first movie to be shown was the silent feature Wanted for Murder. It was a love story set in and just after the First World War. It starred Elaine Hammerstein. I do think if the theater is ever renovated and reopened as a theater, it would be neat to show that movie again. Unfortunately, according to the American Silent Film database, this movie appears to be lost. When originally built, African Americans were forced to sit in the balcony which they had access to from the separate door and go up the stairs out of sight of the white moviegoers. The balcony was also furthest away from the screen and had far fewer seats. And as a general rule, the balconies were not as well maintained or kept clean like the rest of the theater. After segregation ended, some theaters reserve the balcony for smokers. I haven't found out if that was done at the Cole Theater, but as a child in Fort Worth, there was a single screen theater that we frequented, and I remember us kids always wanted to go sit in the balcony rather than the main floor, in spite of all the smoke. And I would assume that a lot of kids felt that way all over the country. Also, there is a section of seats in the balcony that are original from 1919. They're on the left side facing out towards the screen. In 1936, the theater was renovated and renamed the Cole. The roof was raised and the Art Deco facade was added along with changes to the inside. Unfortunately, no photos of the interior before the renovation have been located as far as I know. Other than movies, the theater was also used for concerts, community events, talent shows, and the like. It was during the Second World War that the Fort Bend Opry, which eventually became the Rosenberg Opry, was created and performed there. I have found a few references to it in the local papers. After the theater stopped showing movies at the end of 1982, the Opry continued for many more years. Behind the stage, a door and 
some of the walls were covered with signatures from various entertainers who performed there. One such singer in the late 90s or early 2000s was a young Leanne Rimes. Unfortunately, someone painted over the signatures during some work on the theater. After the Second World War, in order to combat the growing influence of television, Hollywood initiated such programs as Stars Across Texas, which brought actors such as John Wayne, Gene Autry, and others to the cold. This was in order to publicize the movies and get people excited to go out to the theater. Beginning sometime in the 20s, A.J. Schubert would paint murals inside the lobby that depicted India, Arabia, Hawaii, and other such exotic themes. The murals had to be painted over when the talkies arrived because the acoustics inside were terrible and sound would echo from the lobby into the theater. A flannel tent was put up on the ceiling and sound absorbent mats were put on the walls. Aside from the murals, Schubert also built light fixtures, drew plans for expansion, and ran the projector during the silent film days. He even loaned the coal lanterns when it opened for refugees during Hurricane Carla in 1961. During that storm, the theater, along with the courthouse and jail, was one of the safe locations downtown for people to escape the flooding. Many workers, along with other refugees, had to sit up in the theater seats for the duration of the storm. When the electricity finally returned, everyone in the theater cheered. Mr. Cole then suggested to the projectionist to run a cartoon along with previews and coming attractions. The crowd loved it and wanted more. For many residents, the theater was where they got their first job or the place they would go to on dates or to see popular movies of the time. Several former employees remember that March Cole was a practical joker and among his repertoire were a rubber rattlesnake and tarantula. The Cole Theater ceased showing movies on Sunday, November 21st, 1982. The final movie shown at 7 p.m. was Poltergeist. A former popcorn girl who worked for the theater in 1958 recalled the doormen wearing white dinner jackets and Saturday morning cereals and bank night, which was literally a showstopper. At 8.30 p.m. on slow nights, a dartboard was wheeled out and two audience members participated in spinning and throwing a dart at the board. If the dart hit your number, you could win a jackpot, which could be a couple of hundred dollars. And this was at the time when the price of admission was about 10 cents. A quick internet search shows that over the years, there has been interest in renovating the theater. Some work had even been started only to stop. Hopefully someday before it's too far gone, the coal can be renovated and once again become a working theater. After the marquee was removed several years ago, you could see the original name Liberty and what looks like two diamonds on either side of the word. Originally, those were swastikas. They were added when the theater was originally built in 1919, before this symbol was adopted by the Nazi party in Germany. Generally, its meaning is translated as all is well or well-being. There was some debate what to do about them, but someone eventually decided to paint over them and hide the symbol. When built, the theater had a 500 seat capacity. In the 1970s, when VCRs began to come on the scene, 
they started taking business away from the theaters. Around this time, the Coles started to get out of the theater business. Between then and the early 2000s, the theater switched owners frequently. About 1998, a new owner, A. Bode Higgs, bought and renovated the theater. New equipment was brought in to host the Rosenberg Opry for television broadcast on Friday nights. An orchestra pit was added and this reduced the seating to about 350 to 450. Among the celebrities who visited the theater during its run, it is believed that Clyde Barrow and Bonnie Parker, also known as Bonnie and Clyde, may have visited the Liberty while there. Another story has it that in 1934, before their crime spree caught up with them, they stopped by the Eagle Cafe and Hotel on the corner of Main Street and Avenue F. Because of the press coverage of their activities, they were recognized immediately. It is said they ordered their food, quickly ate and never looked up. Nobody called the police and when they left, according to the stories, Clyde had left a large tip. And of course, what would an old building be without a few ghosts hanging around? One story is that a young woman or girl can be seen sitting on one of the seats towards the front of the theater. The second involves an older usher who worked for the theater in its heyday, whose footsteps can still be heard in the back of the theater and walking down the aisles. It was mentioned that there are many other such stories I did encourage my informant to write them down and record them in some way, and hopefully that'll happen soon. Thank you for joining me for this walk down memory lane. If you have any questions, comments, or memories you'd like to share in the comments, please feel free. Thank you.